This is Daybreak, and thank you for staying with us. The hashtag on X is Daybreak. The SMS code is 22422 at Citizen TV Kenya and at Ayub Abdikadir. John Waiganjo is a commissioner with the Independent Policing and Oversight Authority. Andrew Kamili is an advocate of the High Court. Shukri Wachu, seasoned journalist, has reported extensively on cases of extrajudicial killings and forced disappearances, currently liaison officer between ICJ Kenya and Missing Voices Initiative. And Wanjira Wanjiro is the co-founder of Madare Social Justice Center. I come to you again, Wanjira. Given what we have talked about, is there enough awareness around also the aspect of um, even as you seek justice because from the timelines i see you have also been monitoring cases of extrajudicial killings and specific police officials who have uh, been hauled before courts of law across the country but also are you creating as 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 an initiative awareness campaigns around young people's involvement in activities that are productive rather than being deemed as uh, those who engage in criminal activities because some of these flimsy excuses border on the same. But what are you doing in your awareness campaigns about non-involvement in what could be deemed as acts of criminalities? All right, thank you for that question. Before I answer it, I'd like to address what was raised by Commissioner here and say that um, there is sufficient documented data about police involvement in extrajudicial executions. This you cannot deny, you cannot. This is there from the Who Is Next report documented by Madari Social Justice Center, by this report by Missing Voices that was uh, launched yesterday that says police killed 118 as Nairobi leads in extrajudicial killings. Uh, 10 people have uh, been disappeared. And there's a story of Mama Martin that I also want to highlight uh, that is with the Imlu case. Her son was buying mandazi with her daughter. Akapata, the restaurant where he had gone for mandazi, the restaurant uh, they have not cooked. He left the daughter with the restaurant owner and went to a, to a nearby hotel to get mandazi. Mm. And this is where he was packed into a pro box, disappeared, never to be seen again. Mama Martin was called later that evening and told that uh, Martin is in a Buruburu police station where she went and was told that Martin is in Mama Lucy, poli uh, Mama hospital. Lucy hospital. She went there, there was no Martin to be found. She sat through the bodies, there was no Martin to be found. She went back to the police station and reported that Martin is not at Mama Lucy. The response that Mama Martin got was blows and beatings and torture from these police that are telling her Martin is not here. So we cannot say that these are not things that are happening in our country. These are not numbers. These are families that have lost their loved ones. These are families that are losing their sons, their fathers, their brothers, their husbands. So this is not just a number. This is not just that every organization that is working on. These are real, real people that are meant to be protected by this police force that are meant to be safeguarded by this police force, that IPOA is mandated to ensure justice, to ensure that they have brought to book all these police officers. Like here, this um, article by Irongo Hilton says that all the police officers who've been accused of extrajudicial killings continue with their work. Only five have been arrested, yeah? Continue operating within the system. So this is a crisis that needs to be given utmost attention, even as we seek for the collaboration between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. OK. Um, Commissioner, I'm sure you want to respond to that. Yes. Earlier on, you uh, pointed out that uh, there are no as such major challenges when it comes to your funding in terms of your operations. But that is a contradictory statement when it comes to or, or rather, it's not a similar statement as what your chair says. When she was uh, asked, this is uh, Anne McCory, the chairperson of the Independent Policing and Oversight Authority. Are there challenges the authority has faced in carrying out this mandate? She said the greatest facing ch face challenge facing the authority is resourcing. Yeah, there's no contradiction, uh, Abdikadi. You, you, you said you have no problems with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I said is that uh, unlike in the past, where we would get a lot of uh, uncooperation yeah. from the officers or from the senior police officers. We are able, or, or even from the state itself, we are able to carry out our mandate without any impediment. I did not talk about budget. Budget with every government institution is an issue because we, have, we are in eight regions across the country. We have 
probably 270 investigators. Our establishment, according to SRC, should be anywhere between 1,350 yeah. uh, officers across the country. Our budget is below 1 billion. Our estimated budget is 1.5 billion. So I cannot sit here and say that we do not have challenges on budgeting. Yeah. But I can sit here and look you in the eye and say, we have no interference with, this, with, the, with the state on carrying out our mandate. And I'm saying this clearly because we meet. Um, I am aware that uh, the coming weekend, we are going to be sitting constitutional commissions and independent offices yeah. uh, together with the, um, the deputy president and representatives from the state. We are going to be sitting so that those independent offices and constitutional commissions can give their charges on perhaps registration, amendment of their acts, and such things. So I did not say that we do not have any problem with the budgeting, but what I said is that we have created a rapport with senior officers, so we have isolated cases where there are cover-ups by police officers. But by and large, I think it's good to give the devil its due. And that's why I said we can see, we can see more, more and more uh, cooperation uh, at, at the level yeah. of the police officers. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, to go quickly to what uh, she said, yes. I do not say that there are no uh, police brutality in this country. I would be the last person to do that. In fact, we have sat here with, uh, with her yeah. uh, when she pushed me on the issue of the Rashid investigation. I told her Rashid will take a plea in, in, in the fullness of time. And it has happened. The reason I'm saying yeah. that there are other people who abduct people and yeah. make them disappear is because we carry out proper investigations and find that that is the, the truth. In this country, there are people who will come and abduct and kill. We have criminal gangs. We must admit this. And the reason I'm saying this is that we also must give police their due. For instance, I cannot understand why they are not in this panel. Because what we do is that sometimes we con condemn police officers and mercy, the whole service. Yet, we have very professional young uh, police officers who do their work very diligently. So if we sit here and not give them yeah. credit, yeah. because IPOA is not just about investigating and uh, charging in court. We also look at their welfare, and we also want to professionalize the service. So we want to see more inclusiveness, even of the members of the National Police Service. If there was a, a member of the National Police Service here, they would be able to be advocates for themselves. So what we are lacking, and that's why uh, everyone blames the police officer, is because the police, uh, the National Police Service, first of all, they do not have a union. Secondly, they do not have vibrant advocates for what they do. Yeah. And uh, thirdly, they are always condemned in the court of public opinion. So we need vibrancy and we need the members of the National Police Service Commission to also talk on behalf of those officers. Every officer we take to court Abdikadil, we've never seen the National Police Service Commission bring in an advocate, even a state council, to come probably and defend them. They are always on their own. And you know in most instances and most institutions, you find somebody charged in court in the line of duty, you find that they have advocates paid by those institutions. So what I'm saying, Wajela, is not that there is no police brutality. There is, and plenty of it at that. But at Ipoa, we must be careful also, because once we charge an officer or yeah. recommend charging, then that officer will not get a promotion, will not get transferred, will not get cleared, probably interdicted, and that's also a Kenyan. So we must also wear the lenses of a Kenyan when we are also looking at the members of the National Police Service. Uh, okay, and, and uh, to be fair to the members of the National Police Service, of course, they all deliver their assignments with distinction and determination. And, and this is not uh, um, a broad brush painting of what one or two, three persons does to judge the majority who go about their duty as required by the law. But then when you have uh, state officials as high as that of the office held by the Prime Cabinet Secretary, Musali Amundavadi, who defended Kenya's human rights records at the integrity and the integrity of police service during the 44th ordinary session of African Union Executive Council of Foreign Affairs in Addis, Ethiopia. He said that uh, police brutality does not occur in Kenya. Do you agree with that statement? Of course, no. And you know, I want us to remove politics yes. from what we are talking about here. Because we have had uh, statements made by even cabinet secretaries uh, transferring officers commanding stations in a public rally. 
We don't take that seriously ourselves. So what a politician will say out there is not what exactly now we look at ourselves. We are professional. We are not a pressure group and we are not an NGO. So every step we make must be based on the law and evidence. But yeah. I agree. Politicians talk from both sides of the mouth. I have been one myself. I've been a member of parliament. <laughs> so I know. I'm talking about things that I know. Okay. So we cannot take what politicians say to be the truth. And of course, we condemn it because a whole cabinet uh, secretary, actually prime cabinet secretary, we are ashamed that that statement can come from an officer, of a state officer uh, of that level. Actually, to, to that extent, it appears uh, the cabinet secretary or the prime cabinet secretary goes even against what is the position of the government. Because as late as, uh, uh, I think, four or five days ago when uh, General Gola was being laid to rest, the president was very unequivocal on the position of the government that he actually, the government actually acknowledges that there has been extrajudicial killings and that he confirms to the country that they are committed to ensure that none happens going forward. So therefore, I would agree with the commissioner and even my, my, my dear sister here when, when they say that the prime cabinet secretary maybe for the reasons of uh, uh, diplomacy would have wanted to paint uh, Kenya as a, 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 a very attractive country out there to their colleagues. Mm -hmm. Not so bad. However, he must be able to stand on the truth most of the time and defend the position of the government. But also just to adjust on what the commissioner was saying, I seem to uh, look at uh, what the public understands to be the judicial process. And uh, I get the impression that the public, most of the time, uh, uh, seem not to understand. And it is then the responsibility of the judiciary to make them understand the processes of uh, dealing with such uh, very uh, uh, strong cases. This also borders closely on how the human rights and the pressure groups view the yeah. processes of, of the court and the, and the judiciary. You realize that when somebody is brought before court and released on bail or bond, the general psyche of the public is that that case has ended. You look at the comments on the so social media, and even in the common uh, settings and and informal discussions, they'll tend to think that these people have been bribed, the magistrate has been bribed, the judge has been bribed, or even the investigative authorities have been bribed to let this, but that is not the true position. It will have to be realized that such cases require real evidence, watertight cases, that then the IPOA has to you know, investigate accordingly and present something watertight before the DPP, before they can charge this person. You will re you'll remember that the commissioner was telling uh, my sister here that at one point we had this discussion, and I committed to you that one of these parties will be brought before court to take plea. At that time, I think the psyche and uh, the thinking of the public, including the pressure groups, okay. was that uh, for over five years, this guy has just been doing their work. You know, nobody is putting them to accountability. When in real sense, investigations were going on. And uh, now that is before court, it is, bef it is uh, uh, the responsibility of the court to you know, look at the evidence that has been brought by the, 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 the IPO and uh, what the DPP will be able to bring before court. So in my view, the judiciary, and this thing actually came up uh, during the high court interviews for the judges, the judiciary must take it as a responsibility to educate the masses uh, you know, to which they uh, expect to dispense this justice, okay. to understand the processes of the court so that then when when somebody is released on bail and bond, or bail and bo bail or bond, they need to understand this is a matter of right. You know, you not go before court and you're told because of this and that you're going to be denied uh, bail and bond. It has to be proven before court that the circumstances should compel the court not to issue this. But look at it this way: the court has all the capacity, even to the level that we then would claim that somebody has been abducted and they cannot be found, to even issue com orders as compelling as habeas corpus. Just keep, I mean to that level to ensure that justice is dispensed. So I think uh, we need to understand the process of the court to, to the extent uh -huh. that the court has capacity to deal with these matters to that level, mm -hmm. and also that the processes of court take quite some time, depending on the cases that are brought before them. Cases of murder, yeah. such real cases require watertight cases. You're not going to be, you're, going to, you're not going before a court of law and say that there was a report by this pressure group that states that this police officer had killed somebody. I think the commissioner must come up with something proper and tangible yeah. before the court can be able and to dispense. watertight this. cases. We'll be talking about that in, in the case of why it had taken so long between 2017 up to now where the case of Ahmed Rashid is ongoing and also the firm cases that had led to conviction successful convictions in, in courts of law that I poor had fast tracked and that depending on of course the threshold of that evidence before courts of law which are courts of evidence. Shukri coming to you. Looking at uh, the age bracket of most victims 18 and 35. Yeah. This is worrying isn't it, isn't it as a society and this should worry us. 
It's really worrying because even, uh, but before I proceed, I'd just like to say that sometimes you cannot relegate every statement by uh, a government official as purely political because you have to look at the severity of the words and the platform whereby the prime cabinet secretary was talking about these issues. This is a regional a regional platform and the words he says really hold power and I as I earlier said it's really a disservice to people that are actually working hard to ensure that uh, this menace is actually a thing of the past but uh, in terms of the numbers and uh, the age bracket it's shocking to imagine that uh, the youth are actually the people that are most targeted in these operations the age bracket of those killed is between 19 and, and 35. And when you look at uh, uh, the data on uh, the operations that are being conducted by police, if I can go through them, you look at anti-crime killings at 58 in uh, the 2023 report. You have anti-terror killings at one, anti-poaching at two, anti-riot 45, that was obviously during the, the, the man to man of the nationwide protest we saw on the cost of living in the country and uh, GBV cases at five as well as uh, seven, that was under unclear circumstances. Ayub, I think this is really worrying because as we've said, it seems that police officers are actually changing tact in terms of how they're operating. When you look at the de demographics of the people being targeted, we spoke of people in the informal sector, Matatu uh, mm -hmm. operators, border border operators, uh, students, and I think the worrying thing, and we've spoken about accountability, and uh, Commissioner will be the first one to say, from my CJ point of view, uh, you've actually engaged with my executive director, Dimas Kiprono, and uh, program managers, Julie Wayu and Vincent Kimadi. And we will be the last one to say that you've not really championed for, uh, for accountability. But it is worrying, Ayub, when you look at the figures, 100 and. Uh, and 28 people killed or forcibly disappeared. So that is 118 yeah. killed, 10, and forcibly disappeared. We do not know where they are. Yet, when you look at the statistics of those that have been arrested, police officers, it is at five. 113 mm -hmm. still rendering their, their duties. They, no charges have been preferred against them so far. And the five that we've managed to document as missing voices, uh, there are actually cases of gender-based violence where officers have actually been involved in altercations with their loved ones and unfortunately it ended in death. So I think a lot needs to be done and these are some of the concerns that we continue to raise. And I believe that uh, particularly when you look at those demographics, those are things that uh, need to come out to the fore. And even when we talk about the change of tact, yeah. you work with... Um, with communities at the grass uh, root level. Mm. When you hear change of tact there, there's increasing cases of, uh, of people that are being killed by either informers of police or mob justices. And as I said earlier, when you try to, to cover and report on this, uh, these things and try to collect data on the same, it becomes, very, it becomes very difficult because the police will say, look, this is not us. This was actually citizens that did this and killed people. But those are some of the tactics that, uh, that they continue to do. And unfortunately, uh, there's debate and discussions on whether there's a, a soft approach being, approach being used or yeah. adopted by mm -hmm. police officers. So those are some of the concerns that are, that are being used. But oh. it will seem that the numbers might be significantly Higher. Okay. Um, Commissioner Waiganjo, uh, and this is the interesting part, and this is uh, in relation to Police Sergeant Ahmed Rashid, uh, who was captured, as I earlier mentioned, allegedly shooting two young men, uh, Jamal Mohammed and uh, Mohammed Dahir Khair, in front of a crowd at Amal Plaza in Isili in Nairobi. The video of the shooting went viral, public statement is divided, as uh, to his support and some who were against that. It happened in March 2017. But IPOA recommended legal action against Rashid after concluding its own investigations in November 2022. What happened between March 2017 and November 2022? Uh, first of all, I want to say that, and also going back to Washu, um, uh, you have come up with figures. I want to say that we have 208 files right now pending at the Director of Public Prosecutions. Uh, we have a liaison desk at the ODPP, uh, so we are able to work quickly, but still most of our files are stuck there. So when you look at the figures, uh, we have carried out, we carry out investigations and finish. We give recommendations to the ODPP, and then it's the ODPP now to make a decision.
whether to charge or not. So um, in the case of Lashid, yeah. and I also want the probably the public, uh, because the case of Lashid was um, uh, similar to another case of an officer who killed um, um, suspected criminal um, criminals in Gedorai, uh, Kizit, and the, the problem that we had mm -hmm. is that first of all, and particularly in Lashid's case, he was a healer in his Lee. And it's the members of the public, uh, particularly the members of the business community, who would um, shield him, who would uh, not come forth to give us uh, proper um, reports or even uh, statements, because we also work with the public where we need uh, to correct statements from the public. That is our starting point. So when um, we, our, our investigations are not uh, obviously very smooth learning, yeah. and uh, some of it, uh, most of it, we do it um, uh, in COVID undercover. Mm -hmm. because we also want to protect our, our investigators. So that period of time, and I think uh, we had made uh, three attempts. Uh, we had forwarded our files to the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. In the first instance, then the file was returned to us with the recommendations to cover up certain gray areas. We went back for further investigations and gave back the file again uh, to the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. And still, the file took quite a period uh, at the ODPP before it was yet again brought back to IPOA for yet further investigations. So it is only at the third instance uh, that the file never came back, but also took some time at the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. And that is where pressure piled up from IPOA, from the civil society, from the public, until now he was taken to court. So it's not that once we carry out investigations, uh, that we ma we, we, it must be seen that the person has been brought to court. Because it's not exclusively our, our mandate is to investigate and recommend yeah. charges to the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Those are the people now who take the files to court. And then, of course, there's a court process to conviction. And I want to say, if you look at our convictions, you will not find a lot of acquittals. And that tells you that our investigations are prosecution bowed. And that's why we take time, because we are dealing with um, members of the National Police Service, and we are also avoiding litigation, because we could also attract a lot of litigation if we took uh, half-baked evidence to court mm. and get acquittals. But very quickly also to add, when we are talking about uh, enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings, we must also realize we do have other actors, uniformed officers, the Kenya Forest Guards. We do have the Kenya Wildlife Service. We do have the Kenya Prison uh, Service. Mm -hmm. All those are actors in the, what I, I would call this uh, security criminal justice yeah. space. Mm -hmm. And you find that the Kenya Forest Guards, uh, you find a lot of deaths. Um, in those spaces. If you look at the KWS, you will find even more. And when uh, reports are made to us and we carry out certain investigations and find, hey, eh, this is not a member of the National Police Service. Our mandate adds strictly with the members of the National Police Service. So what we do, mm -hmm. we push the matters back to the office of the director of uh, the DCI, uh -huh. I'm sorry. And uh, incidentally, when uh, officers commit crimes, uh, for instance, murder, and we go to carry out those investigations, sometimes the challenge we get is that the DCI also very quickly picks up that file and carries out investigations. So we have an overlapping mandate between uh, IPOA and the DCI, and that is also a, a, a gap that we are recommending. Because when the DCI takes up a matter of a police officer who has killed or committed murder, for instance, or grievous uh, bodily harm, then, or, 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 or even sexual assault, what happens is, is a cover-up. And when the matter goes to court, uh, then the evidence in court is not sufficient yeah. because the police, as you know, cannot investigate themselves. Yes. So we have, we have, we have those kind of challenges where, we, we, on the one hand, we do not have murder even to go to the prison. Uh, to the prison, and you know there are very many deaths in prison. Yeah. And we have the Coroner's Act now that is recommending that the coroner general must inform IPOA of a death in prison. So 
when the coroner then therefore informs us and we do not have money to get into the uh, prisons, then you see, then it becomes a problem. So, uh, and that's where we are going back to say policy, uh, yes. filling yeah. gaps, registration, yeah. etc. But let me also finish by saying this, uh, um, I mean, uh, Abdikadil. We have consistently sought funding to carry out a public inquiry mm -hmm. on um, enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings. And it's a huge budget. We have trained our officers. We have had back-to-back uh, -back trainings of our investigators, of our monitors, of our researchers. We, have, um, we are prepared. Because uh, IPOA is the, is, the, is, 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 the, is the authority that has given yeah. the mandate to, okay. to, to carry out such investigations. So in the event that we could get uh, funding to carry out a public inquest so that the people can come and give their stories, I see that as a point where then we, we will be able to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. And, and as, as, as part of your recommendations then, is it important to then recommend a change in policy. For example, the case of where you said that your mandate ends with the National Police Service. What then happens if someone is killed by, say, for example, KWS officers? That becomes a matter for the DCI. So what we are doing... Do you recommend two MPs then to relook at that law? We have. We have, okay. we have a you raft. You recommended that? Yeah, we have a raft of recommendations. And Parliament is dead against that? And Parliament, in fact, we are, right now we are trying to push through the omnibus, yeah. you know, so that we can see, even if we don't come with the <laughs> standalone registration, yeah. at least some sort of amendments can be done yeah. within now that space, at least for those that are most urgent, yeah. like the prison service. In because fact, if, if, if we operationalize the yeah. coroner's office, yes. then we will have a a crisis, a gap, yeah. where the coroner is telling us there's a death in prison, yet our act does not include oversight on prison officers. Yeah. So we, we have done those recommendations. Yes. We have uh, talked to the committee of uh, national security, yeah. and that's the committee where we go to get our funding. So we have asked them to look at those recommendations and take them to Bunge and have them registered so that we are e even overlapping mandate. Because, I mean, DCI can investigate anything and everything. So when we, we come as a poor and say, look, our act provides that this is our matter, uh, the DCI says it's also our matter. And if you look at the law, indeed, it's this matter as much as it's our matter. Okay. But uh, we have an agreement, uh, but, but that's just an understanding. Okay. So we need it to be grounded okay. in. Yes, actually, I if I come to you. Uh, okay. The Missing Voices Coalition and ICJ Kenya have actually made several recommendations to various duty bearers within the criminal justice system. The National Assembly, ODPP, uh, the judiciary, and uh, part of what uh, Commissioner is talking about is actually we've made recommendations to the National Assembly calling for the amendment of the IPOA Act just to expand uh, uh, their ma mandate in terms of what he was saying because there seems to be a lot of bottlenecks in terms of them rendering their mandate. But, uh, Commissioner, you also spoke of uh, the, cha the working relationship you have with uh, the ODPP and uh, I know that part of the challenge, and it's part of our recommendations actually, is we've called for the development of ODPP guidelines on the investigations of extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances in particular. So it seems that that is where the problem lies because you might conduct your investigations and submit your file to the ODPP, but that is where the, the challenge is. Mm -hmm. Yes, Wakili, um, uh, mm -hmm. coming to you. Um, the, the aspect about the age bracket that we talked about in terms of those who fall uh, victims and uh, when you look at it from the extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances, both in uniform and non-uniformed, as Commissioner Wagan just mentioned, is that this is also a group that is susceptible to subscription to terror groups. Yeah. And then if you look at Gangs. the amnesty, which was issued in 2015 by the late Joseph Nkaiseri, who then was the interior CS, and you look at the age bracket of those young Kenyans yeah. who are given amnesty, it's more or less the same. Yeah. And when they came back, they talked of stories how they were brainwashed yeah. as to how the terror group on the other end, Al-Shabaab, had told them about job opportunities, going there, then only to be trained to come and blow themselves up here at home as homegrown jihadists. Yeah. But does it, again, should, should the policy makers think about this matter yeah. as 
a ticking time bomb that needs immediate attention that if socioeconomic disadvantages are not addressed by policymakers, then this is likely to snowball into other effects that may end up hampering our national security. Mm -hmm. It is actually a very serious thing and uh, that brings me to the other angle through which I wanted to look at this whole conversation and that is uh, the question of what would be done in the preventive what should be done to forestall, you know, uh, uh, these extrajudicial killings? Uh, what can be done proactively without having to react to when things have already uh, gone south? Now, uh, you have talked about the age within which uh, most of uh, the victims fall, and that is the age of the youth. We have to look at what then informs this. Uh, just a few minutes ago, I was watching from your news that uh, in Mombasa there is a gang of young men uh, you know, walking in the streets and attacking people and uh, to, to an extent uh, even uh, committing very heinous things. Uh, we have seen uh, several elsewhere, even within the terror uh, uh, groups, mm -hmm. uh, so many of our young people get there. But then we should ask ourselves what could be informing this and then what uh, uh, could be done in remedy. That goes to the software of this discussion, that then if we were to solve this problem, do we look at the question of employment? Do we look at the, questions of, uh, the question of drugs and the substance abuse? Do we look at such uh, other things that may not be very directly uh, related to uh, the discussion that we could have, but could be the foundational issues that need to be addressed before then we could have young people uh, exposing themselves to such kind of things. The report in itself outlines actually that uh, most of the cases are due to uh, crime activities that then uh, you'll see, for instance, the, 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 the party in Isili the other day that on a border border shot somebody who had millions of money and then ran away with the money, uh, the probably a young person who was engaging in a crime as evidenced by that, but then uh, maybe to uh, the level that the police are provoked and they, they react uh, extrajudicially. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things we need to look at and understand what then could we do to forestall this. The other things that we need to consider including how to deal with drugs and substance abuse, how to deal with the question of unemployment, and also how to deal with the societal pressure around young people on how to acquire money. There's this thinking generally that you could make millions in days or two. And then that is what could be pushing young people to what? If I could just go and do this one uh, simple crime and get this much money, why won't I do this? So if we deal with such, th such things, we'd be able to have halfway dealt with uh, yeah. extrajudicial killings. But that also takes us to the other bit of it. Who are directly responsible? The police officers that the IPO have been talking about. While we we would want to see convictions. What would we do to prevent this from having to take that direction? One, we need to investigate and inquire the kind of police officers that join the police service. They need to understand that this uh, service was fashioned from a police force to a police service. That then even the thinking of the police officer, the mode, the modus operandi, how they operate should have changed from a force to a service. That then they need to understand that they're to Michigan water. It is not about killing the people that then will have them on record as the best police officers, but on dealing with issues proactively and actually even forestalling such cases. Now, how then again do we deal with uh, the, the, the other concerns that they have? Is the welfare concern that the IPO was talking about? Are we talking about the much money in remuneration that the police officers are getting? Are we talking about uh, uh, their health issues? The IPO has just uh, uh, told us, and I see that in court every other day, when police officers are brought before court, how many of them are even able to access justice through representation by advocates of the high court? To that level, we could be able to understand the grievances of the police officer. Once we get that and understand that a good portion of them are actually working within the confines of the law, we'd be able to weed out the bad characters and, and uh, in the end uh, get to the point where we are dealing with extrajudicial killings substantially. Okay. And uh, in your first submission, you mentioned that uh, we ought to be optimistic about uh, how we are responding to this and uh, IPO was created, informed yeah. largely yeah. by the discussions around the need for police reforms and then in the aftermath of the commission that looked into the post-election violence and uh, the reports which are delivered at uh, Geneva Human Rights Conventions by Professor Philip Alston who at the time was also a critical member of the investigative team looking into what happened in the aftermath yeah. of the skirmishes. But when you have 113 
more than that number yeah. according to Shukri killed and still we have formed IPOA we have moved from being a force to a service what's meant to be a professional service that helps the Kenyan people Is, mm -hmm. isn't it not concerning in our current dispensation that we still are talking about the same matter that uh, informed the reason as to why we have an agency like IPOA and why we have moved into a, a new dispensation which is the current constitutional architecture right. I agree with you to the extent that uh uh, there's need for a speedy and a, a more expeditious way of dealing with, the, with, the, uh, with these issues. However, my understanding of the reason why I think we need to be a bit more optimistic is that the background against which this conversation arises is the fact that this country has had issues with extrajudicial killings long as 1963 when the country was born up until uh, a few months ago. Now, what then should happen? We need to inquire if the government or the, the executive and the legislature are providing funding to the, right, funding to the right authorities as required by law to deal with these issues independently. The IPO is independent. They don't, need, they don't need no influence from nobody. And if they will be able to be funded accordingly and no impediments are put or no barriers are put to obscure their progress in the, in the, in the course of uh, uh, executing their mandate, mm. for me, I think that is progress enough. If you look at uh, 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 the judiciary, are we getting convictions that is what we expect. Are we getting acquittals whenever the situation demands that they are, they are, they are required to be acquittals? If justice is being dispensed in the manner in which it is supposed to be done, for me, I think that is progress enough. Now, we need to look at the Constitution of Kenya 2010. What was the anticipation of the draft of the Constitution vis-a-vis -vis what they intended to cure? They intended to cure the fact that we need to uh, have accountability. We have authorities that enforce that accountability. We need to have justice. We have the judiciary, which is independent now, which has been funded accordingly with judges uh, 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 being employed uh, uh, day in, day, okay. day out. We have the office of the DPP properly funded as well. If these are happening, then we need to have a part, uh, to, put a, uh, to give a part on the back to, general, to the general country and those who are running these offices that those so far, we have been coming from a dark past, but we're moving in the dark direction. Okay. Uh, perhaps to we... Yes, let, let me get the account of Anjira and then I'll come to you. Yes, please. You had a thought about what you said? Actually, had a thought I, I wanted to add yeah, yes, on what uh, he was talking about. Why are young people vulnerable to, to all of these things that are happening? And I think the short answer to that would be the lack of social justice and dignity <clears throat> that we have been pushing for. Because when we lack social justice, when we, like the, we, when we lack the, the right to food, the right to housing, the right to water, the right to good health, doctors are still uh, on, on strike, strike, you know? When all of these are happening and then we switch on the TV and see billions of money stolen, you know, billions of money, corruption, then there's a disconnect. And then you see how uh, the different people are treated. Like when a young man steals a phone in Madare, it is to probably take the child to hospital, probably to f put food on the table or to parent, you know. And which when which we is not right. Which is not right, yeah. for sure, absolutely. But I want us to see what conditions push people to do this. Because when, when we are documenting like IPOA, we're also trying to do social investigation. Mm. What was happening? And recently, we saw a case of a young man who had a child in hospital. And the hospital bill was about 7,000. Community members tried raising. And to um, Libaksha, 4,000. And it was so sad this, uh, coming back in the evening mm. that this young man was burned to death. On, the, on, a, on a motorcycle, Wakienda, uh, they had snatched a phone and they were burned to death when they were caught. So these are the conditions that also push the young men to risk their lives. Everybody who goes out there to snatch a phone, they know they're risking their life. They know they might be killed. They know they might be shot dead. But then again, what is our government doing? Because these people are Kenyans. These people are marginalized and vulnerable. And nobody wants to be marginalized 61 years of Thai independence. Nobody wants to be vulnerable like that. So what is it that we can do as a country to ensure we're taking care of the youth in the country, we're taking care of the people that need our support the most? Because we, <clears throat> we have not seen our government really take responsibility for these populations that we see are marginalized. We've not seen, even with the current floods that are happening in Madare, we have not seen our government. When we say 40 plus people have gone with the river, we have not seen any kind of help come to, to the community. And this is 61 years after independence. So what we really continue to push for is when lawmakers are sitting down to make decisions about the country, can we center social justice and dignity for the people before anything else? 
Mwalimu Julius Nyerere from Tanzania said, development must be development for the people. How have the people of Kenya moved forward in terms of development since 1963? In terms of schools, in terms of healthcare, in terms of housing, in terms of water, in terms of taking care of the drainage in the country, we can see floods all over the country. So there's something amiss and we see a lot of debts coming into our country. We don't know what this money is going to every time we see yeah. Uh, the president has brought so much money, but we fail to see the realization of this development and growth from the ground. From here's, the the, here's the thing though, um, Wanjero, six years later, we're still talking about the same, same problems that were outlined by the embryonic administration then. Mm -hmm. And six years later, our healthcare system is not functioning, our education system isn't either. Our infrastructure model is one thing. We are unable to deal with floods mm -hmm. here in Nairobi County. The Met Department yesterday said all the 47 units are, the counties are areas of concern. Therefore, as we lay blame on the doorsteps, at the doorsteps of uh, policy makers in this country, do you have hope that they address our problems? Because when you look at politicians, they end up feeding from the same trough, but largely they scrap hip issues in regards to what the Kenyan people are affected by when it comes to the outlined issues of health, education, and infrastructure. Abdi, we must always have hope that things will get better. Hope is the, is the one that keeps driving us to continue doing the work that we do to continue striving for the best. But we also want to tell the people of Kenya to also be on the forefront of ad advising this, advocating this, and even giving their own solutions to what they think we could do, they could do best. Because I don't think uh, the leadership has any idea about how to go about what is happening in the country. I don't think there's a deliberate effort to actually ensure dignity for majority of Kenyans that are uh, in absolute lack uh, right now. So there's absolute hope because the people are organizing themselves now. We've seen these justice centers across Nairobi, mm -hmm. across the country, across every. And I wanted to suggest also to Commissioner Waiganjo that perhaps partnering with the justice centers in the different areas in Nairobi, if you go to Kibera, you'll find Kibera Justice Center. If you go to Kayole, you'll find Kayole Community Justice Center. If you go to Kisumu, you'll find a network of justice centers to the coast in Kajiado. So perhaps working together would help us uh, okay. ensure justice at a speedy rate uh, and also <clears throat> ask that Kenyans near these justice centers offer their support, whatever it is, in, in resource, in uh, their person, like the lawyers, you know, we need, yeah. we need lawyers up on the ground. Mm -hmm. So Kama, you can, you can be able to offer your support to the justice center nearest to you. Kindly let's partner and see how we can move together to realize a better country because this is not it. Okay, yes, Commissioner, I'll come to you, Shukri. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I hear you, um, uh, Anjiro, but I also want to say that uh, we voted uh, perhaps a little more than two years ago. And so the government we are talking about is our government. The governor of Nairobi is your governor. And the Nairobi people voted for him. So um, it's the people uh, who puts in governments. So we cannot be voting every two years and making noise that year. So I think the public has also a responsibility to scrutinize and to know who they want to vote in for. But going to Akiri, and you know, the, if we are talking about the age bracket of um, 18 to 35, yeah. that's the age bracket of our police officers. Exactly. Yeah, and the other thing we need to understand is that uh, in places like Madare, Kibra, and other places, you realize there's not much economic activities in well, those areas. Right. Uh, we have done our mapping, and we know where the hotspots are. And you rarely get uh, issues of police brutality up, you know, up country, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. People are in the farms, people are milking cows, people are doing all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But this is where the hotspot is. And the other issue you must also realize is that sometimes those young men, both in the, in, in, in the slums and in the service, work together. Mm -hmm. So you, you'll see a sort of a protection uh, between them and sharing of their spoils. Mm -hmm. And when things go south between them, yeah. what happens is uh, yeah, clearly extrajudicial killings. Mm -hmm. So they are hunting each other on the, on the beat. So we must realize that. The other thing Abdikadi, that we have a problem with in the, in the membership of the National Police Service is recruitment. Mm -hmm. We have recruited thousands of police officers, not because they have a calling, not because they even wanted to be police officers, because their parents, the senior members of the service, all those people just 
come together to make sure that they are keen, kids, mm -hmm. all join the service. So you putting somebody in a, in a service that you know, should be taken up by people who have the calling, the passion to work for Kenya, mm -hmm. and putting them in Keganjo, training them. Then once they come out of training, instead of being uh, deployed, mm -hmm. fairly close, some of them live in Nairobi. So they can't be taken to the villages. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So we have a demoralized service. Mm -hmm. And I want to say most of the junior officers mm -hmm. really needs a lot of a lot of help because within the rank and file of the service, we really have a lot of officers who are very demoralized, mm -hmm. who have no equipment, mm -hmm. whose relations, especially those in hardship areas, go with their seniors, mm -hmm. whose allowances have not been paid for years. Mm -hmm. You can imagine even those officers who went to, um, to protect voters during voting, some of the allowances have not been paid. And those allowances were already released by the Treasury. So where is the money? Okay. So even as we talk about this, we must also look at the National Police Service, the leadership of the National Police Service, mm -hmm. and also um, the, the government, of course, the Minister of Interior, mm -hmm. in looking into the issue of recruitment. Mm -hmm. Because recruitment is where the problem starts. Again, yes, yes, Shukri, before we sample I, the I feedback. I think I mean. Commissioner Iganjo raises some very interesting points. And uh, I remember when I was in the newsroom covering some of the... Uh, the reforms within the National Police Service. And I think it was during the tenure of uh, Joseph Boynet, mm -hmm. they introduced a new uh, police curriculum. And uh, it seems that there are glaring gaps, and I hope that maybe they can be resolved. But at the end of the day, it's the end of the day. And uh, I would imagine the individual sitting here, we also don't want to paint a very gloomy picture of uh, events that are happening. We've seen accountability uh, uh, from IPOA's side, Obviously, it can always be improved. We've also seen police officers that are trying to do great work within our communities. And I think it's important to mention that uh, the Maraga-led task force report oh, yeah. actually made several recommendations yeah. to try and address legal, policy, institutional, and uh, operationalization challenges within uh, the various formations. So I think that uh, we've always had challenges when it comes to implementing these documents because people say uh, in a car vizuri sana, but implementation is always lacking. So I guess that is where, uh, if within the time frame of three years, if the that report will fully be actualized and implemented, I think that the challenges we're seeing within the police service yes. can probably be, be addressed. Mm. And also the task force uh, speaks about the welfare of the uh, police by, ex by extension, and, and, and that is where also mm. um, the, the problem lies, or the, one of the major areas of the, of the problems, owing to how they are underpaid in terms of their welfare, um, the problem with their housing and the capacity the government said would provide for, and of course they have families that they attend to and, and bills to pay, therefore yeah. it isn't a wholesale condemnation of uh, the police, but rather the minorities that, uh, the minority that's within the service, and like, just like any other setup, whose uh, conduct should not be uh, judged based on the majority who are doing incredible job in terms of undertaking their constitutional duties. Mm. The feedback here on the broadcast, the hashtag on X is daybreak, the SMS code is 22422 at Citizen TV Kenya and at IU. Abdi Kadir hears what you are saying on Twitter, the X formerly Twitter. Babo Michel K says extrajudicial killings have been going on and many, many cases have been investigated by IPO and other bodies in vain. This gives perpetrators of such acts more courage to do such unfortunate killings. Justice must and should prevail no matter what. As I say, killings, hap, killings happen in business disputes or otherwise contribute to a climate of fear when individuals disappear without a trace. It undermines trust in government and deters citizens from reporting suspicious activities due to potential repercussions. Engineer Lazaro says to investigate extrajudicial killings isn't really easy. Those who are talking about watertight cases, are they pretending or just out to please the public? Police will never investigate itself and come with meaningful reports. Babu says again, if even half of the cases of extrajudicial killings in the last five years haven't been successfully concluded and perpetrators brought, perpetrators brought to book, or taken to jail, then it's certain that we have terribly failed on this as a country, not just. Sir Nixon de Gure says, I think our national ID cards should be GPS chipped such that locating a lost or missing person will be much easier, or at least locating the last whereabouts. 
Team Kenya says the poor should be serious. We can't get professional police service if we don't clear the mess at recruitment. Does any sane person expect thieves, robbers, inhumane people who pay 500,000 in bribes to join police force to produce anything good? Well, this is according to Team Kenya, and it's not the view of the Royal Media Services or Citizen Television. Olum just says the problem is not the police. These people are under instructions from higher officers or officials. Officers, yes, in addition to the frustration they are going through, coupled with mega remuneration, the government must allow the police to have their union. Gabi Wakasiaka says there is need for reform within law enforcement agencies to ensure that suspects of these extrajudicial killings are treated fairly and that the rights of all individuals, including innocent people, are protected. Frank Orinda says extrajudicial killings is still here with us. Those in authority tend to think that only way to silence, the only way to silence government critics is to eliminate them. It's sad that the police who should protect life and property are the same ones who fire at citizenry, causing injuries and death. Ladies and gentlemen, your time is all appreciated. What a time to have this lovely discussion here on the broadcast. Wanjira Wanjiro is the co-founder of Madare Social Justice Center. Your time is appreciated. Yes, I give you... Yeah, please, one minute. 20 seconds. Oh. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, closing. Uh, and I because you're to... the only lady, you're the only one who's <laughs> Thank granted. Thank you for the privilege. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to uh, raise awareness on the floods that are happening in yeah. Madare and the impact that we have had so far and uh, call for solidarity to the people of Madare. We lost Mama Victor and one other member of the Mothers of Victims and Survivors Network to the floods. It was very devastating, picking one of our comrades from the Madare River. The students in Madare don't have books. They all went through the water, bags, uniforms, mattresses, everything. It's really horrible. And we call upon Kenyans to stand in solidarity with victims of flood in Madare, as you can see. We call upon people with expertise of uh, maybe diving to help us retrieve bodies because so many people are still I'm sorry. So many people are still missing. Mm -hmm. We are not even able to say how many as of now. So we call upon uh, Kenyans to stand in solidarity with us in okay. these trying moments. And we send solidarity to all victims yeah. of floods across mm -hmm. the country as well. We thank you. Wanjera Wanjero is the co-founder of Madare Social Justice Center. Shukri Wachu, season journalist and extensively reported on cases of extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances. At the moment, he is the link of sub between ICJ Kenya and the Missing Voices Initiative. Andrew Kamili, a, a, Andrew Kamili is advocate of the High Court and commentator on social political affairs and John Waiganjo, commissioner at the Independent Policing and Oversight Authority. Ladies and gentlemen, your time is all appreciated and many thanks for gracing us thank and we don't take that for granted. We really, really thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you too for working up with us here on the broadcast and uh, your feedback here on the broadcast. The hashtag on X has been direct. The SMS code 22422 at Citizen TV Kenya and at Ayub Abdikadi Sambituko. We'll be back on Monday next week with daybreak here on the broadcast. Up next is DJ JG with Gospel Friday. Thanks for watching. Good morning.